today that's taking those broken wings and flying away and uh, right into the arms of Matthew Dickinson who loves catching birds. <laughs> Are you good bringing those songs into our conversation? Oh, well, I try. <laughs> anyway, you had a really big one last night. It, the meeting was uh, expected to have a lot of people, so you changed the venue to uh, have it at the theatre. I would love to have every council meeting in the theatre. It was actually really well set up, and we had we worked at about 240 people in the audience, which is fantastic. Mm. I love to see people come along, watch democracy, watch what happens. Some meetings, because people can watch them online now, some meetings we might get two or three people turn up to the meeting. So it was actually really good to see a big audience there. They were very respectful. They didn't make any loud noises or carry on. So I think it was really good they watched re debate. And our councillors are always very respectful. They debated things, let other people have their say, put their points of view forward. So it was, it was actually a really good meeting. I really enjoyed it. So they had a microphone out there so that they could communicate, you could hear what they were saying or...? You have a, a part of the process called public forum, so very close to the beginning of the meeting. You can have five minutes for you to say, have your say about a topic, typically on the agenda. It can be any council-related topic. So that's the first part of it. After the public forum finishes, then that's it. So you don't, you don't get to come forward and join in the debate, if you like. But councillors obviously have their microphones and people can listen to them online or watch it in the audience. Mm, well, last night was a very big one, and that's why you had a lot of people there, because they were talking. Uh, they wanted to know really about what went on with the sale yards decision with the council and uh, whether or not you chose to sell them off or keep them in council hands. Mm, so that was exactly the reason there was a lot of people there. And what was good about that was that we've had some people talk to us at previous council meetings, we've had people come along to council meetings, people get a bit excited about, you've made a decision, you've made a decision. Last night, I can say, categorically, was when the decision was made. There was no mm -hmm. decision made beforehand. Councillors, it would actually be a breach of the Code of Conduct policy if you did make a decision before the actual decision last night. So councillors debated it, went back and forth around the room. Three options we had, Chris. One was sale, one was lease, long-term lease, 20-year lease, and one was to keep it internal and change the business model, change the operating model. And there was a fair bit of debate, a lot of discussion. I can say pretty clearly that I don't know that any councillor was going down the sale option. The debate really focused on the lease or the internal model. So I think the sale option was ruled out pretty early in that process. Mm -hmm. And the debate went along those two lines, lease or sale. Lease, for some councillors, they put some views forward around lease because of the simplistic process with the lease. For example, we lease out the caravan park. We still own the caravan park, but day to day we're not running it. We've got NRMA that leases that and we just get given a return, we get paid amount of money each year. So that was still one option that was discussed. As it went through the debate, finally the time came to vote, the time came for you to say which way you voted, and the final decision was keep it internal with a modified business model. And I'll talk briefly about that modified business model. Mm -hmm. At the moment, there's a whole range of different ideas, a whole range of discussion about exactly how the operating model works at the moment. The DWSA, Domestic Stock and Station Agents, and the agents themselves and council are closely intertwined in how it works. So I don't want to get bogged down on the exact operation and who does what where. That was part of the reason we started this review because there was a grey area there about exactly who did what and how they did it. We've now made the decision to say we will take control of the sale, the sale yards, the process, the weighing, the recording of data, etc. So council will be in control of that. So the DWSA doesn't need to be doing that part of it. We still need agents. We still need agents out there doing the conversations with the producers, getting organising cattle and sheep to come in, running the, the, the auction as such, running the sales, but we'll run the operational side of that. So that's fine, that's clear, we'll go through over the next six months and actually refine exactly what that looks like and how that all looks. One of the other points that was made during this debate, during this service review, was that an agent found it difficult to come in and start selling cattle or sheep on the sale, at the sale yards on the public facility. And that, again, there was a discussion about could you, couldn't you? It was complicated, other people said it was easy. But in the end, we said, no, we need to make it easier. So in the past, one of the barriers to entry for an agent was a fee, 12,000 or over $12,000 you would pay as a one-off fee to come and be an agent at the double sale yards. And so that's a bit of an impediment to new agents. Everyone said we want those sale yards to grow. They inject money into our economy. They actually are great for the throughput of, of cattle and sheep. 
So the more agents, the better. So instead of that $12,000 fee, we said we'll make it a $200 fee, dramatically less, and just do it as an annual fee. So that's just a way to keep those agents up to date. That means any agent out there that wants to sell at our sale yards, before it was typically the 13 agents involved with DWSA, but now it'll be opened up to anyone that wants to come along and pay their $200. There'll be some checks and balances, obviously, and they can start using those sale yards. So that's a significant change as well. Mm. But that's great because we want more people using yep. the sale yards. We Indeed. want more agents. We want more throughput. More throughput means that council get more money, but also the community gets more money. People said they wanted it retained, so that's where we went. But again, more throughput. The, the other thing we did was we changed the pricing. 32.5% increase on pricing for cattle, 27.4% increase for sheep. So that'll mean $16 the council will receive per head of cattle, $2 per head of sheep or per, per sheep in terms of the income for council. So with those changes, we believe we can fill the million dollar gap where we were losing or, or the uh, overall uh, process for council was at the point where if we looked at the accounts, they showed a million dollar loss per year or, or certainly this year. So we want to fill that hole. We eventually want to get to the stage where we're making some money out of that facility, but at the moment, let's fill the hole. And so that'll do that. We believe those prices will change that. So good debate, a long process we went through. It started back in 2021. We've arrived here now at this final outcome. And I think good for the community, good for the agents, good for the producers. So overall, good outcome. And the people that were there were happy with the outcome? Well, it's interesting. I did talk to them at the beginning about our code of meeting policy that uh, in terms of creating disorder, I did say to the, the audience, I don't want to see clapping, booing, cheering, etc., because that could be trying to intimidate people into making certain decisions. So I said that would be an act of disorder and I can expel everyone from the meeting if that happens. One speaker spoke and they did clap and I said, okay, that's it, that's your one warning. I don't want to hear any more because I don't want to kick everyone out of the meeting. I want people to hear the debate, but I also need you to follow the rules. These aren't my rules. These are the rules of Dubbo Regional Council Code of Meeting Policy. Mm. And so after that, they were perfect, didn't make a boo. At the end of the decision, when the final decision was made, that might have been when I thought they might have cheered because they're going to leave anyway after that. So <laughs> they probably didn't care if they <laughs> got kicked out. I was wondering about that, actually, <laughs> if they were going to hang around for the rest of it. Well, that's interesting. I'll get to that in a moment. But certainly I thought that might have been the time when they cheered or whatever. But no, they didn't. They were very respectful. But given the feedback we've received during this process, during this whole ongoing debate, I suspect that people in the room, the agents would have been happy, this is what they wanted, the producers would have been happy, residents would have been happy. So I think in general, people are happy. But I did then say after that, I'm gonna have a five minute adjournment just in case you wanted to leave because sometimes people say that was the thing that I wanted to be there for, I don't really wanna hang around for the rest of the meeting. The next item on the budget was our, sorry, the next item on our agenda was the budget. $180 million budget that we've got for debate and for final approval, but most of the 240 people left after that, which we kind of expected. They were there mm. for one particular purpose. But it is interesting, the amount of debate we had over the sale yards was a lot. Even another item on the agenda, which wasn't that big in terms of dollar terms, a lot of debate, got to the budget. There was a bit of discussion around the budget, not a huge amount, but things like the Cameron Park toilets, that was a bit of a discussion on the debate. Fixing up the, the last council had a number of toilets that were there and they replaced them with fewer toilets. That's created a lot of angst in the Wellington community for a number of years. So going down that process of starting to fix up that particular problem. So a bit of discussion about toilets there and in, in some cemeteries, fixing up some toilets there, but not a lot of debate. And there's a thing called Parkinson's Law of Triviality. And it says the amount of debate from any committee, the amount of time spent on the debate, is inversely proportional to the amount of dollars being spent. So mm. we're talking about some things like sale yards, sure, that was a, a, a big thing for that, but we're trying to get an extra million dollars. A lot of debate around that. Got to a $180 million budget, not much debate on that. Now, and I'm being a little bit trivial there because we've spent three months going through the whole budget that we've got to mm. arrive at this decision. So there has been three months worth of discussion and debate by councillors, but at the meeting itself, there wasn't a lot of debate about that next item on the agenda. So it's been approved then? The budget has been approved. So from the 1st of July, council can still continue to operate. Uh, we've got the 5% rate increase, which is the rate pegging amount. So that's something that was not discussed too much, but a little bit of discussion around that. We haven't asked for an extra rate increase. There's no plans at this stage to ask for an extra rate increase above rate pegging. So that 5% was what IPART recommended for Dubbo to keep in touch with inflation. Now, you also had a bit of a talk about the parliamentary uh, inquiry 
and finances, and that is also to do with the toilets, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was today. There's been a, a parliamentary inquiry. This has been an ongoing oh, process. Okay. So, so it wasn't last night. It wasn't today. last night, no. So there's a thing called the parliamentary inquiry into the financial sustainability of local government. And they go around and meet at different places and have discussions with different people. So they invited me along as a witness today to mm. come along and talk about the financial sustainability of local government. So I gave initial presentation. Now, this has got a number of people on the committee. It includes Stephen Lawrence, MLC, former mayor and former councillor of Dubbo, but he sits on that particular parliamentary committee, other parliamentary members as well. So basically, I gave a short presentation about the, the overall view of council around that. They also wanted to ask me questions about regional cities, New South Wales, because I'm the chair of that, so that represents 15 cities. So I gave some answers about the road network, about some discussion there around roads, about arts and culture. And then I got a question about toilets. And <laughs> of course. About the expense of toilets in Lions Park West. It, these questions were not asked by our Dubbo MLC, our former council. They're asked by another member of the committee about the Lions Park West Dubbo and about the cost of toilets and about the individual cubicles. And I did make mention of the fact that those Cameron Park toilets, councils are keen to get those fixed up. Mm -hmm. And we went through about the I think, trailblazing aspect of what we've done with the 3D printed toilet. And in fact, there will be more houses built in Dubbo now as a result of that. And certainly the state government is looking at social housing using 3D printed processes. So I went through, they asked about cracks in the toilets. We've explained that before, micro cracks in concrete. These aren't structural cracks. So certainly the cracking process is, is nothing. And they asked my final comments. And I actually said, Chris, I'm pretty disappointed. This is a parliamentary inquiry into the financial sustainability of local government. We're talking about a $180 million budget. We're talking about, in Dubbo's case, a 2.9, call it a $3 billion asset base, talking about how state government can make sure that local governments, 128 local governments across the state, can be more financially sustainable. And really, it was political posturing about a toilet. So <laughs> I did say that at the end. That was my final comments. Any final comments? I said, yes, I'm disappointed that We've gotten to the point of getting a discussion about a couple hundred thousand dollars in toilets when we're really trying to talk about the ongoing financial sustainability of Dubbo. It really was just some political posturing. So a bit disappointing from that perspective. Well, getting back to last night, uh, you made a decision finally about the squirrel gliders. Hey, squirrel glider, maybe singular, maybe not there. There was uh, a large amount of discussion. This comes back to that Parkinson's law of triviality as well. The potential amount that this developer would have had to pay if we agreed with the biodiversity conservation process and the 85 credits they needed to retire was approximately $60,000. We definitely debated this longer than the $180 million budget. So <laughs> this, this law of triviality definitely stands. There's a lot of discussion about this. Does the squirrel glider still live on this camp road development? Do we know that? Now, the, the perfect quote for this is the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Mm. You can sit there and look for a week where this squirrel glider was last seen back in 2018 and you don't see the squirrel glider, it doesn't prove there's no squirrel glider there. Yeah. The only way you can prove anything is to see a squirrel glider and say, there you go, there's a squirrel glider. From the Biodiversity Conservation Act, it says, has the habitat changed significantly? No, it hasn't. Therefore, the squirrel glider could still be living there. So there's a fair bit of discussion back and forth. We had some legal advice around this. I actually think one of the things that changed the mind of some councillors was one of the councillors asked a question of the staff to say, do you know how much, what percentage of land is being cleared for this development? Now, the staff people didn't know the exact number of hectares, but they said, in general, most of the development is staying true to the natural form, and there's certainly some clearing that will occur as part of the development. And I think that made councillors feel a bit more comfortable that this wasn't a uh, terrible development that's going to wipe out all the trees and take mm. over. It was being done in a conservative nature to try and conserve some of the natural area. So in the end, councils voted to remove the condition that required a $60,000 payment approximately to be paid from the Biodiversity Conservation Trust. So that payment isn't required. That developer can now go along and get on with the development without paying that money. Well, that is a positive step in the right direction, especially for the developers, because uh, it is a big amount of money to be spending. And uh, in these days, it all helps to um, keep it in their purse to help get development in our town. 
And there might be some people who argue the other way. Chris, there might be some people who say, that's a terrible outcome. Mm. We need to conserve all of our biodiversity. The greens. But, but, <laughs> but again, this is the, Sorry, the debate greens. about about that. And I think ultimately, councils made a decision where I think it was based on common sense. And I probably think the other part that swayed councils a little bit was that if the money is paid, so here's the thing. Let's say there is a squirrel glider sitting there and it's living in its natural habitat. People would say, let's conserve that. Let's keep that as it is. But if the $60,000 was paid, if we had have gone ahead with that process, then that $60,000 means that that developer can start knocking down trees, knocking down the squirrel glider environment straight away. I'm not saying this developer would do that, but I'm just saying the payment of that, where does that money go? So councillors ask that. Obviously, it's not going to that squirrel glider family. Mm -hmm. They're not going to build a new house for him somewhere. It goes into the Biodiversity Conservation Trust Fund for somewhere in the state, some area to be protected for squirrel gliders. So it might even be anywhere near Dubbo. It could be hundreds of kilometres, yep. a long way from Dubbo. So I think that swayed councils a little bit as well. So I think a good outcome for the developer, for the community, a common sense outcome. Again, I'm sure there's some people who might think the other way. Let's hope that uh, if the squirrel glider does return, they find a new tree to live in. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, this is something very interesting because you've had the vampires attack you today and there's a big blood drive on at the moment and all the councillors got down there, not all of them, I suppose, but a lot of them went down to our Dubbo Blood Donor Centre at 1150 Darling Street and donated blood today. Yeah, that's right. So this is a blood drive, a local government blood drive. We did the same thing last year where we basically are just encouraging the community. They do the blood drive for the first three months of the financial year, so July, August, September. Obviously, this is just before July now, but again, we're part of that promotion, close if enough. you like. It's yeah. close enough, that's right. So part of that promotion to help encourage people to give blood. And they do do a little bit of a competition. So when we looked at that competition, for example, we came fifth last year out of the blood donor centres and we came 37th across the nation out of 537 council areas. So I'd encourage people to go down there and be part of this and hopefully we can push the Dubbo Donor Centre and of course the, the Dubbo LGA up those rankings just a little bit because everything's a competition, Chris. So mm. I think it'd be an excellent outcome for lots of people to get down and give blood. It doesn't take too long. Plasma takes a bit longer and I'd encourage people to give plasma as well. That does take a bit longer but they, they need definitely both blood and plasma. And next week we're looking at 23 donation appointments needing to be filled. So if you can get down there, please do and donate some blood. And we uh, always promote that here on DCFM 88.9. Hey, well, good. Matthew, thank you very much for coming in and telling our community all about what went on at the meeting last night. And uh, let's hope we can have another chat again soon and uh, find out what happens at the next council meeting. Sounds great, Chris. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us here on DCFM 88.9. And uh, we'll get into a couple more songs for you right after this.